to everyone. And before I start, I would like to welcome Anna Anna Duncan with a gamosa, which is actually from my own community. This is how we welcome people. So I'd like to give you a Welcome to India and to the Press Club of India. I want to be a This is a whole thing. Okay, and uh, before it comes up. Thank you. Okay. okay. No audible now? Okay, great. Should we use this one or this is one phone? Okay. Okay. So anyway, so let's start and um, yeah, before we get down to talking about your incredible journey, I just want to point out that uh, what is Press Club of India a little bit. Uh, this organization was started in 1957-58, so obviously that makes it the oldest uh, Press Club of India. And um, we also have a women's press club where some members are here. And uh, you know, it's a one of a kind uh, press club only event for women journalists. Uh, so that's why I thought I must mention it. But of course, press club, um, you know, over the years uh, have always uh, stood up for journalist rights, have issued, uh, uh, you know, statements whenever required, stood up with uh, the media industry, and uh, raised voices multiple times whenever needed. And uh, so personally, I can't uh, think of any better platform than the Press Club of India, than Anna Duncan, to be talking about your excellent work. So, um, let's start by actually, um, you know, because this is, uh, you may not be uh, aware of the kind of work that you've done and you're doing. So, uh, let's do a bit of foregrounding, okay? And maybe begin with your, how you look at your identity, where you were born, raised, and also, you know, I mean, like all your uh, campus uh, experiences, school, college, and what brought you to journalism, actually? Yeah. So I'm going to remove, uh, remove this because I'm getting hot. <laughs> um, okay, so I was born in Accra, Ghana. And uh, when I was uh, two years old, my parents uh, brought us to Canada. And uh, in Canada, we, we landed in. Uh, one of the major cities, Toronto. And I ended up growing up in a city north of Toronto called uh, Newmarket, which is very, which is much smaller and has less uh, racial diversity. So I was growing up in um, an area where there were very, very few black people, very, very few black people. Um, and then uh, from there, uh, I moved on and I got to um, uh, my, my first degree at the University of Toronto, a, a, a double major in uh, psychology and philosophy, um, an honors bachelor of science, and then I moved on to my second degree um, uh, in journalism at, at Western University uh, to get my master's there. And uh, I got into journalism because um, what I was always interested in, thank you very much, What I was always interested in uh, was, <clears throat> so I, I grew up loving books and reading, and uh, I, but I was also a performer. So I performed in, in dance, and uh, I used to sing. And so what happened during my education was I wanted to marry them somehow. So radio was perfect for me. When I got to radio, I found out that I could Engage in my interest of talking to people, learning about people, writing, learning, putting things together, but also, frankly, my ego needed the performance. And so I like to perform on radio. And from there, what happened was um, I was doing some, some radio while I was in university where I was, I was uh, working on a show called Talking Drums. It was an African show for two hours at York University. And there, um, I did some reporting on um, on what was happening in different African countries. <laughs> I would say that um, journalism worked for me because I truly enjoyed the opportunity to learn about people, but also have an opportunity to, many of us journalists may have this, you want to save the world. 
You want to save the world. You want to be the voice for the voiceless, or whatever it is that we say to ourselves. And now I've started rethinking that idea of the voiceless. To me, no one doesn't have a voice. It's just that other people are not hearing. That's the way I like to think right now. Um, I hope that helps. <laughs> okay. So, um, you know, I also you worked at the uh, CBC for several years. You hosted the uh, uh, very well known uh, breakfast show. So tell me, at some point, you actually thought of voicing uh, this whole race relations that were at play, you know, at, uh, at the newsroom. And uh, somewhere I read that you actually were very vocal about um, uh, talking, uh, you know, working with white directors and all that. If you could just take me yeah. through that, yeah, that would be very interesting. So um, I worked at CBC for about 15 years, and while I was working there, I worked in a number of positions. I was a host, I was a producer, um, I used to uh, 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 write um, as, a, as a producer, I also um, I did a number of things, I can't remember everything now. But the point is that um, in the course of my work there were moments where I could tell that people were not interested in having me around, or that they were not interested in my perspective, or that they saw me to have a very narrow place in the world. And I found that to be unfair. Sometimes people would say things to me that were, um, I would use the words out of pocket or just rude. Um, and other times they would underestimate me or underestimate what I was able to do. And I found that to be very unfair. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, in one instance, so I'm a person who likes to wear very bright colors. I'm from Ghana, that's what we do. We like patterns. Um, I'm sure you know something about wearing bright colors. So uh, I walked into the office at one time and my executive producer, um, she said, that's a really nice dress. Where did you get that? Did you get it from Jamaica, mom? <laughs> and so to me, I was actually really confused to her. I think she was just being funny, you know, uh, that, that maybe this dress was from Jamaica and she wanted to put on this accent. But uh, I get that kind of stuff a lot, where someone assumes where you're from and then they kind of just make jokes about it. When you do this kind of thing, it makes someone feel like they don't belong where they are. It might be a joke to you, but if that's a person who's been getting these jokes all the time, it becomes more than just a prick. Now it's a cut, and now it's a gash, right? So the way I see it is that after some time, I realized that what I was doing was pretending like that wasn't happening. I was pretending like Did, did you happen. want to, uh, at some point, also want to belong? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did. And so what I, like, it led me to realize that when people were saying these kinds of things, that I, I found that now when I saw other people of color at work, I would, I would um, get close to them and I would say, are you okay? Are you getting um, paid as much as you, as much as you feel you should? Are you being treated properly? And then, um, and then we started an employee resource group, an affinity group for employees of color at CBC. And I put my hand up uh, to be a founder, and, and I was, I was a co-chair. And in the process of doing that, we ended up having to have a lot of conversations with management about um, the uh, uh, racist, um, racist reports that we would put out, and also racist treatment within Within CDC, so what what actually led to that uh, that 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 issue? Did you all raise that issue, and that got the management to bring in, or on there their were, own? Yeah, there were a few people who were more senior than me, who had already been experiencing a number of things, and most of them that were black, um, and they were talking about things that had been happening at CDC, and they wanted to come together and say something. They wanted to um, uh, they they wanted to come together. But we were given the idea that we should form a, a formal group and an ERG. And then, um, and we did that for some time. But um, I would say that I spoke up the most after George Floyd was murdered. That's when I spoke up the most. We will we, we come to that. Yeah, so I also want to ask you a little bit about, you know, the research that you did. Okay, what did it show up? You know, there was, were there some of the experiences that you actually uh, when people shared with you and where they eyebrow raising um, the research um, at 
at Massey College, do you mean? Or? Yeah, okay. So the research that I was doing at Massey, Massey College, um, this is essentially me doing a number of interviews in, with leaders of color, so racialized leaders of color. And the reason why I was doing that was because I was considering becoming a leader and I didn't see anyone who looked like me. So I was actually very concerned about whether or not people would even listen to me if I became a leader. I was very concerned about how much um, uh, influence I could really have. And so what I found from these leaders is that they um, found it very, uh, uh, some of them found it very stressful to advocate for other racialized people who are under them. And some, in some instances it was stressful for them because they want to support people, but they also know that maybe their peers or their um, their superiors would think that they are offering uh, special treatment, and so there's a line that they have to they have to walk. But I still maintain that we need more leaders of color um, or people of color, racialized people, in these leadership. So um, another question I have is like, um, you know, often when you raise such uh, uncomfortable questions, you know, when you talk about diversity, you talk about equity, you talk about inclusion, um, um, many tend to look at you as a troublemaker. Yeah. You know, you're always coming with an agenda. Yes. Uh, so I just want to ask, uh, know, you know, how was the treatment, I mean, or how, how were you looked at by um, fellow journalists? I think it really depends on on uh, how you present. To be honest with you, um, what I what the privilege that I had at CBC is that I was a host, and I was um, uh, when you're when you're a host, and I was also full time. So it's easier for me to raise my hand. Up. It's easier for me to say something because I don't. I didn't have that much fear that someone's going to fire me because I'm because I'm opening my mouth. There were other people that I feel I was kind of speaking for because they didn't have the same kind of um, uh, uh, privilege or standing. But I will say that there were some people I know of um, instances of, of some people um, who did speak up, and they were they were considered they were considered troublemakers. The thing about raising your voice sometimes, at least at CBC, is that you don't always know if somebody thinks that you're a troublemaker. They might not, they may not tell you. What might happen is that if you go up for another job, you may not get it, right? It's, it's, some of it is invisible. It's not direct. So this question is very important, you know, because um, uh, because of the corporatization of media, which is happening globally, and um, so the debt of the trade unions and all of that. So your voice is actually, you know, anyway muffled. So you can very easily be um, uh, kicked out of the industry altogether. You know, I think if you look at that way. Yeah, I have to tell you. Um, so we were talking about. Um, you know, I, I kind of mentioned George Floyd before. After George Floyd was murdered, um, the CBC's um, senior executive team asked me with 16 black uh, people at work. They wanted to hear from them. And after we had that conversation, I remember thinking, as I was one of the 16 black people, I remember thinking. What are we going to do now? Okay, you've heard us. What is what is actually going to happen now? I wasn't confident that anything would be done. And so I called those 16 people, I called all of us together, and I said, what are we going to do? And eventually, we came up with a 10-point call to action that we then delivered to the senior executive team, as, as, and it was publicized. And what I'll say about having done that is that I was very scared to click go. I was very scared to send the email to the president and to send it out on Twitter. Um, Why was that? Because I was afraid that um, I would mark myself as a troublemaker and that they wouldn't, that um, like, that senior folks wouldn't talk to me or that I would not be considered for um, like an, another job. I just, I just thought that I'm supposed to be silent about this. That's, that is where my, my, my uh, anger comes from. Is feeling like I'm not supposed to talk about this. But there are companies, there are media houses that say that they want to represent Canada. You cannot do that if you're not going to address um, the negative things that are happening in your house. You cannot. 
And what that means is that you absolutely have to listen to the ones that you think are troublemakers. You have to listen to them. The troublemakers are the ones who are taking a risk. They're taking risks. Interesting. Um, uh, so now, uh, what we see generally is a global trend that's happening in India too. You know, when uh, you want to correct a wrong, okay, so in the process when you send out to say, uh, 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 you put out an ad for um, hiring, you always, uh, you, uh, it's often we see in India also where uh, women are encouraged to um, apply or we have the, um, the past issue is big here. So, that is, uh, candidates are encouraged to um, uh, apply. So um, that is happening worldwide. We see that you know women of color are encouraged to uh, to apply to this post. So is that is that catalyst enough uh, for a change, or do you think do we need to have more structural changes, you know, which will actually can bring in something onto the ground? It's not enough. There are four things that I think we have to do. One is that we do have to have measures like this where you are explicit in inviting um, people of color or folks from marginalized communities to your uh, to your media outlet that's one the next thing you have to do is that you absolutely have to take measures to retain them it is not enough to say we've hired them it's not enough because what happens often is that they are hired and they're hired at lower positions the canadian association of journalists um, did do a survey, we spoke about it earlier, and what they found in the survey is that most of the diversity is at the lower levels, right? And so these are folks who are part-time, they're doing interns, they're, they're interns. And so we have to do more than just bring them in. So uh, uh, you, are, you are inviting them and you are creating programs to retain them. Then you have to have the leadership. Make sure that you promote folks up to these positions. Um, At a place like CBC, um, uh, it is one of those institutions where uh, a person is in a job for a very, very long time. For a very, very long time. It's very easy for a person to be in a certain job for a long time. They might be in a specific, um, we have to call them steps and bands, you know. So a person, you don't just kick a person out. A person, if they want to stay there, they, they get to stay there. So what we have to do is, yeah, we have to have these um, programs. At CPC, they have a wonderful program called the Developing um, uh, Emerging Leaders Program. You have to, you have to promote people into leadership. So you're inviting them to come. You are putting in programs to retain them. Uh, you are putting folks in leadership positions. And you have to count. You have to count who is there. And you have to be open to accounting who is there all the time. The CAJ, um, last year, when they're, the first time that they did their survey, I think um, they got to about 3,000 journalists. Then it moved up to about 5,000 journalists that have been counted. We have to keep doing this. And we have to count. The numbers will be bad. We have to understand. The numbers will be bad. One of the reasons why some people don't want to participate is because they're afraid the numbers will be bad. But if we just get it out of the way, the numbers are going to be bad, it's fine. But we have to count so that we know and then continue. Yeah, yeah. This is actually so instructive because in India also, in our newsrooms, um, uh, we also don't have much of diversity. You know, when it comes to, say, uh, community representation, caste representation, vision representation, I can say for myself, you know, I come from the Northeast India, where we hardly have uh, people in the uh, Indian uh, newsrooms. You know, I think I'm the only woman who is a chief of bureau in an organization which is very based and uh, maybe I've broken some glass ceiling somewhere. So, and this is 2023. And I remember when I joined United News of India, which is a well-known news agency in the 90s, I was the first woman from the region to be hired at the New Delhi headquarters. And uh, earlier in the day, I was uh, telling you about uh, my experience of meeting the first, uh, um, um, you know, hires, women hire at, at, at the Hindu, and uh, where they were talking about uh, these two women who were hired, but there were no women's uh, uh, restroom for them, so they didn't know what to do with them. Then you know, so this is where uh, 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 they come from. So this is uh, we can actually identify so much as you said. 
Okay, so one of the things I want to ask you is also you, you as, as a woman, as a woman journalist, um, how do you see this whole Canadian media landscape a, of, as a woman and also as a woman of color? You know, there's an intersection there. Are there, are there say, more uh, leaders, women leaders, you know, in, in the newsroom, editors? And I, I know that um, uh, right now, uh, according to that survey, it's pretty much at parity in terms of uh, the numbers of uh, women in the newsrooms that, that were part of the survey. And men, um, it's about 49% men and 50.6 women. And then you have 0.4 uh, non-binary. And so what that means is that the women are there, but they are holding positions that are um, lower, so they are, there are more women who are in part-time and internship positions than, uh, than, than the men. And so what that says is, yes, things have moved, things have moved up. And I would say from my experience, I've had many, many women um, uh, producers and uh, leaders uh, and superiors. So I've had that experience. What I'll say is that if you have experienced hardship, and you have experienced a style of managing, and it's from men, it's very easy to also manage in that way. And that that type of managing may also be against women. It's very possible to manage in that way. So um, I would say that the new type of leadership for women can be uh, coming from uh, understanding what you have gone through and knowing that you don't have to replicate the bad type of treatment that you got. That's one thing I'll say. Um, as a woman of color now, uh, uh, there is that intersection of the type of treatment that I might get. So I'm going to, uh, some folks have been uh, uh, harassed, sexually harassed, um, and then some folks are thought to be the ones that have to take the notes in the meetings, right? The ones who have to organize the parties in the newsroom. The ones who have to clean the kitchen in the newsroom. That's the kind of, those are the kinds of things that happen. And also um, having to manage someone's advances. How do you manage how do you manage someone's sexual advances when you are trying to just work? You just want money and you want to do, or you believe in the job. How do you manage that? Do you say nothing? Do you say something to your friend? Do you say something to that person? I don't, whatever it is, you are thinking, will I have this job anymore? So I don't know if that's exclusive to be um, a woman or a woman of color, but I know that that's something that does happen. Um, to women. Um, what I will say is that it is very concerning how um, it is very concerning about how some women of color are being harassed online. Um, there is many women, many women of color, especially those who hold like TV positions or who um, who have opinion columns, are harassed highly. Harassed. It's I think a global trend now. It is a global trend. It is a global trend. It's happening with India also, and uh, you know, I mean, like you, you know, women particularly, yeah, are also the, the sexual aspect is very strong. Yeah, so that you see uh, in India too. Yeah, and as you know, Middle East and all this, yes, very very strong. Yes. Yeah. So so you have an extra component, you know, when you're uh, yeah. a woman. Yeah. yeah. There so was, there's one thing I want to tell you, and that's about a a survey that was done um, on the mental health and um, uh, mental health of journalists in Canada, and it's about trauma and mental health. And they found that um, uh, black and Arab uh, and Asian media workers had a higher um, instance of dealing with their mental health balancing mental health. Yeah. Well, that would say so much, yeah. So we've come to um, uh, talking about your interesting podcast, uh, Media Girl, wearing a um, badge. So, but before that, I just quickly want to ask you also about, you mentioned George Floyd a couple of times. Um, um, you know, um, I want to start with a parallel 
which actually concerns my region from the northeast India. And a couple of years ago, there was this one young man, uh, Nilo Tania, who was um, a victim of um, a racial attack in the national capital in, in, in Delhi. And uh, that shocked the nation, you know, I mean, and that shocked uh, uh, both sides. And that, 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 uh, the, the, uh, uh, the discrimination actually uh, runs so deep in the nation's capital. And that led the government of India to act and be, uh, so there was a uh, committee and set up and uh, all that. And a lot of affirmative action has happened since then. And I see that uh, uh, the bridge has been, you know, that there's a lot of that gap has been bridged uh, um, uh, a lot. So, um, of course, when we look at this whole uh, uh, black, uh, you know, inclusivity thing and uh, diversity, we uh, actually have to refer to uh, the George Floyd movement and say, okay, it showed an ugly on the belly of uh, the American society. And um, before I ask you the question, you know, I'll be, I, my apologies to you, I, uh, is that uh, triggering for you, really. So, um, just want to ask you, you, you mentioned George Floyd a couple of times, so how has it affected you personally and also your work, you know, in talk? Um, I cried. I cried a lot. Uh, I was very much affected. Um, he was murdered on a Tuesday, and uh, the show that I was working on is called Fresh Air, and it is a show that is, uh, you know, it is a, a lighter-hearted show. It's not a hard news show. So talking to authors and scientists and artists and playing music and talking about the weather, that kind of thing. And I was not in the mood to have that kind of focus that we can. Um, I remember having a conversation with my producer and uh, she said, um, and we were talking and then I just, I just started to cry. Because I remember thinking, so my children are black? Like, my children are black. So what does this mean? What, what am I supposed to think when they leave the house? That this is what's, that might happen to them? This is, this is what I was thinking. And my producer um, was not intent intending to be um, insensitive, but what she said was like, oh, well, that's like in America, that's not happening here. And what she missed is the fact that I feel very connected to any black person in North America because we share racism. We share racism. Um, and so I felt that moment. Um, so I was about four weeks out to um, ending my time at CBC in order to go to that fellowship at Massey College. Which we talk about? Yeah. And so the, that fellowship at Massey College was supposed to start in September, and we're now like June. I was supposed to do three or four more weeks. I couldn't. I actually said to the folks at work, I, I can't, I can't, I'm, I'm done. And so I went on a short term leave. And even now, as I talk about it, I can do so. <coughs> right? No, no, it's okay. Uh, because it's important. What I'll say is that what that, what that time did was that it, um, it made the Canadian journalism. Um, industry look at itself and say, oh, we, we've been talking about inclusion and diversity, but maybe we need to talk about it something more. Maybe we need to rethink some of our processes. Maybe we need to rethink how, um, how we practice our editorial conversations. Maybe we need to listen to the black people who are talking about things happening in their communities. And I think what's good about that time is that certain uh, some newsrooms actually, they really took it on. Some, some places really decided to change their practices and codify them. They tried, to, they tried to look at their policies. Some of them really did. They really made efforts. And I know this because I was in some ways part of some of those conversations. Um, but I will say that those kinds of things, they take continued uh, effort and committed effort. And I think sometimes People get tired of some of these efforts, so they don't continue. Okay. okay, let's um, bring you to uh, talking about media governance. Okay. okay, so this is a very interesting podcast that she runs. She's been running it since 2016, 
and uh, where um, um, she would uh, like to hear from her and how it all started, what, how, who all are your partners and what you do. And uh, just to give a little idea that uh, she also runs a scholarship which is like for students of Allah where they can actually study journalism in Canadian universities to fund that and uh, also a uh, kind of a peer support group and now you are a content uh, producing um, uh, organization so you could just run us through that what, what led you to do that and uh, why uh, you do it the uh, one episode i heard as was a lot of nice lovely giggle and i loved that <laughs> <laughs> thank you um i mean we like to just be ourselves and as ourselves we could go that's fine um so uh I spent about five or six years in the music department at CBC, and I was hosting a show, and I, I, the show that I was hosting was, it was a national music show, and I remember thinking, I want to interview, I, I want to interview, and um, the, in that department there weren't that many opportunities to interview. Um, and then, I remember thinking, I was in my second family. And for anybody who's a parent or who's had a child, sometimes there's a point at which uh, you don't know where you end and where the baby begins. And you sometimes it's a, it's a time of uh, existential uh, consideration. And I remember thinking, what am I doing with myself? What am I doing with my career? And I said that I wanted to interview. There were opportunities. There's no proof that I know how to interview, so I'm going to create it. So I started the podcast. And what I wanted to do was interview people who knew how to interview and then ask them how I did. I knew a number of other hosts in Canada. A lot of them were my friends. So I decided I would interview these people and then find out how I did. Um, in the course of interviewing one, two, three, four, five, six women, I ended up creating a, a, a group chat on Twitter. And that became a place where we just supported each other. We supported each other. Yeah, these are essentially women. They're all women. Yeah. And because it was just my friends, they ended up being a lot of women of color, uh, people who are queer, people who want to have children, never have children, no women who's in politics. Just a kind of a, a wide range of women who work in journalism. And um, we came together sometimes in, in person, and then some ideas started to flow. One of the ideas that came to flow was the idea of, um, of starting a scholarship. And because a number of us uh, are hosts, and as you know, um, hosts have a different, uh, hold a different place in journalism, whereby they are seen more than others, right? Mm -hmm. They're more visible, and in many instances, it means that they have a, a, a larger mm -hmm. uh, sphere of influence. So what we did was, uh, we thought, okay, let's just raise $2,000. We're going to raise $2,000, and we'll give that away as a scholarship. We ended up raising $14,000 that first time. Great. And it grew to be a $30,000 scholarship, and we've given out in total maybe about $80,000. Um, because I'm a professor this year, and my other friend <coughs> and executive director of a magazine, we, we, we had to just pause for this year. But we are very proud of the fact that we were able to give um, money to um, to students, uh, women, non-binary students who want to um, get into journalism, who want to get into media or tech or communications, and we gave those up. We're happy with that. Uh, and uh, so, you, you know what, uh, earlier in the day, we were also, I was pointing that out to you, that when you talk about these women, you know, when you bring them onto your uh, platform and have a very uh, kind of a freewheeling conversation, um, so it, it's also a kind of window, isn't it? And yes. into how they you know, how they have been in these newsrooms and what is the trajectory? Yeah, it was a place where we got to talk about um, issues like, uh, being able to negotiate issues like uh, having doubt, um, and uh, ethics, like ethics, ethics of our work. Yeah. yeah. Honestly, we talked a lot. We talked about um, you know the podcast I did a long time ago. So some things I'm forgetting. But one thing that always came out was that I was always talking to a woman who really cared about her work, and she worked very hard. And I appreciate that, because I am the same. Yeah. 
Okay, so now let's start talking about you know your present assignment, which has been on since 2021. You are the party chair at the, uh, the university. So um, it's a very interesting uh, uh, designation that you have. Yes. So tell me about that, you know, and also do you have any particular agenda or goal? I mean, of course, there's an agenda. Any goal to achieve? And what I gathered is that this is the first of a kind. So yeah. what are the challenges? So the role is the party chair of journalism, diversity, and inclusion studies, and it's a research chair, which means that I am given uh, uh, money and a mandate in order to think about inclusion. And What's the mandate? Um, the mandate is to always talk about inclusion <laughs> and to and always be thinking about diversity and um, to include it in in the in the courses and to support the students and to um, include that in my research. It also means that I'm to do things like this. Um, my personal goal is to make it so that all the students feel like they belong. And when I when I went to university, I was the only. <coughs> I was the only black person in my class, and uh, there was no way we were going to ever talk about this race. Um, in two thousand and three, and there was no talking about race. That, like I just, we just pretended that it wasn't. It, a, it doesn't exist, right? Mm -hmm. And now, um, what I want to do is for students to a feel like it's okay to talk about race and the, and the difficulties of racism. Uh, at work and at school, I want people to feel free to do that. Not that things could, should should always be a place where we are complaining. Rather, to talk about the impacts of the racism and how we can change things. Um, another thing that I'm interested in doing is making sure that students are always thinking about inclusion and diversity in the course of their work. So I have a class called Journalism and Belonging, and in that class, it's very self-reflective. You are thinking about where you stand in the world, what your privileges are, what uh, what you don't have in this world, and how that how you can see yourself um, uh, as an expert of certain of certain things, particularly if you are from a marginalized community, but also how you can support other people. If you're part of a dominant uh, dominant community, how can you how can you support your fellow journalists? One way I'll say right now is that if you're in an edit if you're in a newsroom and you're having a conversation, and I am there and I'm talking about something that's happening in the black community, and I'm giving you an idea. If the editor says, I'm not sure that's a story then your job in that moment is to say, well, wait, let's, let, let's hear a little bit more. Because the one thing that I want editors and I want um, all newsroom leaders to understand is that if I am the only black person in the room, who is the expert? I am the expert. <laughs> right? So if I'm telling you that there's something happening in this community, why wouldn't you listen to me? Doesn't it make sense to listen? Aren't you a journalist? Aren't you curious? The thing that you should do is say, tell me more. What is happening? It doesn't mean that you should call me biased. It means that you should ask me to tell ask me to tell you more. And if you have questions and, and you want me to be accurate, you want me to be rigorous, you want me to have the facts, I can do that too. But recognize that I have something to offer to the conversation. Don't dismiss it. Yeah, this, this brings me to another question. How important it is for the community to tell their own stories? Why is it important to anyway? And if uh, that happens, what is, it, what is the change that we're going to see? Or what will what emerge? Well, one is the expertise, and, and another is the awareness, right? So something that happened in Canada is um, the, uh, the growth of stories around um, Indigenous people and Indigenous issues. Um, at, at the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, a group called CBC Indigenous was formed. And what they did was they started to do, and it was, it was uh, populated by indigenous people, indigenous supporters. And what they did is they started to tell stories from their own community. They started to tell stories about indigenous people. What does that mean? That means that Canada <coughs> gets to understand and know more about indigenous people. One thing that one of my colleagues, an indigenous um, uh, uh, journalist and, and uh, educator, Duncan McHugh, he, also, he always says also that everyone should do these stories. It's not just indigenous people who should do these stories. Everyone should do these stories. It's interesting. So, so there is also, I would like to just um, leave it in that, you know, in our newsrooms also, it's very important that we have these uh, marginalized voices, uh, you know, who need to tell their own stories. 
so that you know they are the experts. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's, that's the important. And, we, and many times I don't see that happening yet in the in newsrooms yet. You know, I mean, like you may you may actually uh, um, want to tell those stories, but it should be uh, uh, through them. You know. So yes, I think that what happens is that you also get nuance, right? So if there are uh, only white people telling stories about black people. Then you're going to get a certain uh, perspective. You're going to get a certain only point. one factor, right? You might you might get one line of story, yeah, and you might get only negative stories. But if you include if you include black people, or if you um, if black people are given um, the latitude to tell these stories, you will find nuance. You will find joy. You will find you will find so many aspects of these different communities, and that's what we want. Also, if you are if you are an outlet that's looking for something new, that's where you can get something new. Is in these nuances that live within these communities. So true. I can personally connect. You know, um, at the wire, I always write very long stories, and I uh, told my uh, director, you know, that this piece. My stories are going to be long anyway because I have so much to explain. <laughs> so, yes, and, and that, you know what? What I what I would love is for us to like. What I've noticed when you start, when you start, um, when people start telling their own stories that happen in both, there's a lot of explaining that that has to happen or that does happen, where you're saying a certain word and then you have to say afterwards, which means that that that, 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 that you know that kind of thing. But after a while, you won't have to do that because it becomes in uh, the public's consciousness, and that's where I think we're all learning more. And uh, to me, that's wonderful. That's me. That's so let's round this up on this um, positive note. And if there are any questions from the audience, I would like to get. Um, let's give the woman who really put on some of the questions. Do you have a mic? Do you have a mic? Hi, I'm Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Hi, You mean the change from yes. like yes. now? Yes, as the digital uh, media the platform brought in change. Yes, and I think we can all. We, I think we can all see it because um, I'm sure all of us know know something more about a certain community because we've seen we've scrolled through it, right? And then I'll say for me, it is the community of uh, disabled people, and disabled journalists, and disabled activists. I really did not know very much about what it is to be a disabled person. But by adding disabled people, disabled, disabled activists and journalists to my feed, I now know a whole lot more. And they are out there. And um, the internet and, and these apps have given many marginalized folks the opportunity to say more about their their communities. Yeah, I have a question. Yes. Uh, no, no, no. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, no. You're Inclusive, inclusive. Inclusiveness includes you. Yes. Yeah. 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 Black people, people who are brown, people from Asian countries, people from East Asian countries, South Asian countries, Southeast Asian countries. It includes all of them. Okay. Uh, uh, they are experiencing some of the same things. Few months back, they were in the Indian media with their experience on uh, something called uh, You can just describe what it was. But also your sure, uh, uh, sexual harassment uh, at you know me to me to women. Yes. Uh, by you know uh, women journalists, you know, by yeah. analysts, you know. Uh, what kind of uh, I mean there would be such experience in Canadian media as well. So Prominent was that moment then. It, it, it was extremely common. Okay. But it was extremely common. So what kind of uh, steps you take in the Canadian media, you know, to what kind of uh, measures you have to go to the court, does something happen? What does the government do? What did the government do? I can't speak to what the government did, but what I will say against them, no? What's that? 
Do you want me to speak against the government? <laughs> sure. No, I actually have nothing to say about the government. What I will say, though, is that um, I remember it being a time where people were really speaking about things that have happened to them. Um, I remember it being hard for some of my colleagues. And to be honest, I remember hearing things about a certain person at CBC long before um, it came out about him. Um, things came out about him. There was um, a host of a popular art show named Gianca Meshi. And um, uh, there was a lot, there was a sexual uh, assault charge there. And it became a very uh, big issue at CBC and beyond. Um, that's really all I can say about that. But rest assured that the, the hashtag Me Too was happening in Canada, not only in journalism, but of course across the country. I mean, we had a minister going to resign, the court case going on, and all of that, and then we are huge. Yeah, after, no, after Sabina. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Sabina. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Welcome to our country, and I hope you have a good stay in our country. Oh, thank you very much. spend a little more time because it's very diverse, and I think we get a lot more to, um, you know, a lot more diversity than perhaps what you've seen in mm -hmm. Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is basically, I mean, we're talking about equality, but I'm more interested in hearing from you about the fact that you talked about racism, you've talked about how you reached out uh, through this media girlfriends, and you've talked about your friends, which I presume I would have understood you right, has to be uh, the women from the same community. So my question basically is, when you took up these matters, I'm not talking about your male colleagues because they can be a different perspective altogether. But what is the kind of support you got from the other community, not your community, women from your community, from the other community? Uh, because are you speaking, are you asking uh, what did white women do? Exactly. Okay. Did you uh, get the support? Uh, yes, yes. Yes. They they did give me support. Um, a lot of. I would say that um, the, the support that I got that was very heartening was from senior white women uh, at CBC who were not um, necessarily, uh, they weren't very loud in their support. Some of them have been loud, but mainly a lot of them emailed me privately to say, what can I do for you? What can I, how can I help you here? How can I help you there? And that was, that was very, very encouraging. That was really encouraging. Yeah. Yes. And also some of my friends are white. <laughs> yeah. And for the, sorry, just 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 on the same question. Um, your media girlfriend now does it also have a lot of issues concerning the white women, or is it basically concerning community okay. and indigenous? So media 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 girlfriends uh, started as uh, as a group specifically for all women, all women. That includes white women. It includes trans women, and it includes non binary yeah, I also had a supplementary question here. I mean, um, what saw it as a kind of an advocacy space, okay? Yeah. So we can continue like that. What is the long-term vision? The long-term vision? Well, at the moment, Media Girlfriends is a podcast production company, and that's what we're going to do. We are looking at uh, bringing back the scholarship. Mm -hmm. We're thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And how we do that. Yeah, so you had a question. Uh, Ma'am, thank you for uh, sharing your amazing journey. My question is that today Twitter or any tweets or sound bites by politicians or studio debates have become more important than reality, than the ground reality. How are you handling that in your newsrooms? And the second part is newsroom itself, especially in India, is not a sustainable revenue model. And that is giving birth to all kinds of paid news, broken news. So how do you look at it? Um, I'll start with your first one. Can you repeat it? The first one is that today the tweet, a tweet or a sound bite by a politician or a studio debate has become more important than the real ground realities. In India or in Canada? Most of them, not in Canada. I am not fully aware of what's happening there. But here the, uh, the ground reality is not that important as important as the sound bites. So the, there's a new, new newsroom created which is uh, of you know just of the sound bites, with the ground realities are totally ignored. Miss Kitty, what you are trying to say is also that the ground reporter. Uh, exactly, ma'am. Exactly. 
you know, reporting to the ground. So okay, it's not happening as much as if you put your mic in front of someone who's, when you say something explosive and then that becomes a part of your daily news world. Uh, what do you have to say to that? You know, do you see this happening in your country? I, I don't know that it's happening in my country, but it also sounds like a question where the answer fixes, fixes a, a big problem that's happening. So I think what's important here is that you said what you said. I think that's, that's really important. Um, I don't know that I have an answer to that. I think that really is up to the newsroom here. Um, but I can imagine that it's a very, very difficult issue. Um, and I don't really know. I don't know that I have an answer to that. What was the second question? It's no more a sustainable revenue model. You know, you cannot trade, you cannot earn by the ads. You know, even today newspaper has been sold at much lower price than on what it's been print. Because if they will sold on that price, let's say it's, if the cost is one dollar, they are selling it for a few pennies only. Why? Because no one will buy on that and the number of papers print will go down. So advertiser will not give the money. It's yeah. say your total circulation is so, you know, the circulation depends on what the number of papers are sold or how many people are watching. So, it's not anymore a sustainable, self-sustainable revenue model. So basically, what he's trying to say is that the, the old model is actually replaced by a newer model, which is, I think, maybe pushed also by the pandemic quite a bit in India. What we see is that like, the, 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 the running a newspaper, you know, the old era uh, family is a huge financial burden. So you would actually not, uh, you, you're, you're shrinking your services and your operations. Did you have a question attached to that? Yeah, my question was that the very, the, the whole news production model across the world is not self-sustainable. Either it is supported by the government. What is, what is the actual question? What the question want? is, how, to, how there is a future for the newsroom when it's not a self-sustainable revenue model? What's the future? <laughs> Thank you for your honest question. <laughs> okay, so this is the last question before we uh, break for uh, so the tea. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, this is you know, like uh, this uh, uh, subject is equality matter. So I would like to know: Is there any uh, difference in the payrolls in uh, the all in, uh, you know like uh, this uh, all India? Yes, payroll? there is an outside oh. one. So um, at CBC, much like a, 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 a number of places, they have a, a, a set program of how you get hired and when you get hired and what position you're in, how long you've been there, what you do, and then your, your pay is commensurate with that. If at the, at the very, if at the very uh, your first position at a place like CBC, you don't negotiate, then you will not be making as much as someone else. So, uh, but what I know is that when it comes to negotiating, more men than women negotiate. Right? More men than women negotiate. So what that means is right even at the beginning, if women aren't negotiating, or are being told to negotiate, or don't understand the culture of negotiating, or, uh, or aren't confident in, in, in negotiating, then there's already um, this disparity. disparity. Right? So, and then that just, it, it continues up, and then uh, there are some positions for which, you know, some people are able to get more money because it's a position that is um, uh, a more visible. That's what I'll say about that. Okay, with that, I think uh, let's wrap up this conversation. Thank you so much, Nana Duncan, for giving us time, and I'm uh, sure you know, like for your experience, with other people to get from it. Um, uh, it's lovely and it's a help to them, as a, you know. And uh, we Thank hope you. to. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sankita. Uh, thank you so much, and I will make over time around the applause. Um, very insightful, honest, frank, 